So the Lady Vols made their hire and Kim Caldwell, and that's great. But Kim Caldwell, boy, does she have some work to do now. The next 30 days, really 23, 24 days, are so critical. And I'll tell you why here on a Tuesday, Locked On Balls. You are Locked On Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, good Tuesday morning, everybody. Welcome to Locked On Vols. We're a part of Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team every single day, and I'm your host, Eric Kane. Every day is today is your show. In segment number three, I'm going to answer many, many, many of your questions for the mailbag edition of the show. Can't thank you enough for making Locked On Vols your first listen, your first watch. You can follow, watch, subscribe, download. That's the key word right there. Download us for free wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and of course on the Locked On Balls YouTube channel. Got a fun show coming up. Kim Caldwell, like the hire more and more as the days go by, but she's got some work to do, and I'll tell you what that work consists of. Caleb Jaro coming in. Um, he's the sports editor of the Daily Beacon over on UT's campus. Going to talk with him about Kim Caldwell in segment number two, and of course, your mailbag questions in segment number three. So what type of work does... Kim Cobb will have to do to you know come in here and try to revitalize this program. Well, first and foremost, you are leaving. You are saying goodbye, essentially, losing two key contributors for this Lady Vols program this past year. Really, the past four years with Tamari Key. I know she's had some uh, medical issues and injury situations in there, but she's already announced that she's not exercising her COVID year of eligibility, so she's leaving the program. Rakia Jackson, who is a really good player for Tennessee, a really good player for Tennessee the last couple of years, or really last year, excuse me, averaging 20 points a game. So you're losing Rakia Jackson. You're losing Tamari Key that you know an awful lot about. Those are two big losses. Um, you are retur- Jasmine Powell, your point guard, who is not fantastic, but, you know, was a starter and did some things. And so you're losing three starters and, you know, one all-SEC caliber player in Rakia Jackson. Recruiting, you've got... Kanya Boyd, who's coming in, she's an early enrollee. Only recruit in the 2022 cycle was Justice Phil Sott, and I'm messing up her name. I'm sorry. I know she's at Vanderbilt now. But um, my point is, you don't have much incoming to your program in terms of recruit. One that's already on campus is an early enrollee. You had a couple of decommits, and Nyla Brooks for the class of 2025, 6'2 guard, combo guard, she decommitted. You had... Another, I can't even read my own writing, I apologize. Another decommitment for the class of 2026, who was really, really close, a point guard, who was really, really close to Kelly Harper as well. So you've seen a couple of decommits in terms of high school recruiting since the firing was announced of Kelly Harper. You only have one incoming you know, person that's already an early enrollee. You're losing Rakia Jackson, Tamari Key, Jasmine Powell. What you have at your disposal is Jewel Spear, who's a three-point shooter. You've got Kalasha Cooper, who had to sit out this year because she transferred past the window. You got Sarah Puckett, who's been here for a while. You got Tess Darby, who really struggled this year. You got Caroline Striplin. You got Julian Hollingshed. So, so you've got a core nucleus that's coming back to your roster. But this roster wasn't good enough to go and finish off beating number one South Carolina, pulling off some of those big upsets, really contending to be atop of the SEC. So what does that mean for Kim Caldwell? What is she going to do, number one, to replace the production of Rakia Jackson, but also to be competitive? I don't know. We'll have to see. I think the next 23, 24 days, whatever it is, 22 days, is going to be vital for Kim Caldwell because, to my understanding, the transfer portal window closes on May May the 1st. So how many of these returners that are currently on scholarship will she elect to keep? How many of those tough conversations that I'm sure are going on right now, which is, hey, my name's Coach Caldwell, yada, yada, this is what I do defensively, this is how I run things offensively, I've looked your skill set. I don't know if it'd be much of a match here. I would encourage you going in the transfer portal and exploring some options for the betterment of you, or you can stick here and maybe not have a big role. I'm sure some of those conversations are going on right now. Nobody's entered the portal at the time of this recording, but I would expect at least some, maybe not an overhaul. I don't think you can do what Deion Sanders said at Colorado. I don't think you can really do that in basketball, but still, I would expect at least one or two to go in the portal, wouldn't you? It's a change in leadership. Um, We'll see what happens. But I would imagine that aside from meet and greets and all that, 
Some of those conversations are happening right now. So what does this roster look like in the next couple of days? Kim Caldwell, who did a really nice job with the transfer portal on her one year at Marshall, at Marshall, about, about said Marshall State, at Marshall, I think we'll obviously have to embrace the transfer portal here. And you really need to go out and get a post. As Caleb will mention in segment number two, man, a lot of games in women's basketball across the SEC are won in the trenches, if you will, in the blocks. This is in football, in the blocks. And that's with good post play. You gotta have some 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 ladies that can go up and get get the boards, can be really productive down around the rim, putting the ball, you know, into the hoop. And I'm intrigued to see if she can go find a big in the transfer portal. So she's already really embraced the transfer portal while she was at Marshall. It's gonna have to be the same way here. And really, that's a movement in college basketball overall, men's and women's. John Calipari leaving Kentucky, going to Arkansas. And a big, you know, po- po- philo- philosophical change is going to follow him, according to reports. He's going to try to leave the majority of the one and dones behind because he's been the one and done coach for so many years, and starts advocating and looking towards the transfer portal, try to, to try to find more postseason success. Because John Calabari, Kentucky, has not had any postseason success dating back to since you know before 2019. Um, so really, it's kind of a college basketball thing that's happening right now and so you got to embrace the portal you've really got to embrace the portal bring in proven vets that can come in and be an impact make an impact day one i'm intrigued to see how uh, kim caldwell attacks the transfer portal as i mentioned in yesterday's show i think one of the first things she's got to do is establish alumni relations she has got to reach out to former lady vols she has got to be a pillar she's got to be a resource she got to say, hey, the door's always open. Come back, be a part of our franchise. How many times have we seen, program franchise, how many times have we seen in all the football coaching hires since Philip Fulmer tried to do something like that? Sometimes it worked. Sometimes it didn't. Um, but this is critical because Kim Caldwell is an outsider. She is not a part of the family, and I have no issue with that whatsoever in the hiring process. In fact, I think it's a good thing. Because as I'll talk about it with Caleb here in a moment, you're not carrying that weight on you. You you recognize where you are. You recognize what's going on and, and where you're playing and who played before you and who coached before you. But you're not carrying that weight of being a former Lady Vol. I think that's going to help her. But you need to establish those relationships and say, hey, hey, I'm here now, but we're still a family. So alumni relationships are, are huge. You've got to recruit well at the high school level. I think it's more important to be active and to be successful in the transfer portal, but you still got to get back into recruiting well at the high school ranks. Um, you got to replenish some of those decommitments that you've seen here in the last week or so. And man, do you have to embrace name, image, and likeness. I don't know what the situation was for women's basketball and NIL at Marshall. I'm not even going to pretend to know. And I'm not going to sit here and say that the NIL world, you know, space here for women's sports is fantastic at the University of Tennessee. It's present. It does things. I think it can be better for sure, but I think you're going to need some help and some, some, somebody advocating for that, like the women's coach of the biggest women's program on your campus. Kim Caldwell has got to fully embrace name, image, and likeness. She has got to be an advocate for name, image, and likeness to the best of her abilities and the most that she's allowed, which right now I'm pretty sure coaches are allowed to do it. You see it across the country. I'm not sure Danny White wants you going out there in a post-game press conference like Lane Kiffin or Mark Stoops and saying, hey, we need more NIL money, all that type of stuff. But you've got to embrace it, and you've got to promote it. You've got to put your face to the Boost Her Club, in my opinion. That's what Kim Caldwell has got to do. So you're inheriting a roster that's still got some pretty decent players, but you're losing the best player and the best piece from your roster from each of the past four seasons to Marquee and, and this past year in Rakia Jackson, who was an all-SEC guard. Um, got a lot of work to do. A whole lot of work to do does Kim Caldwell, but I just, I really, the more and more I study, the more and more I study, you know, her and, and her offense and defense and what she did, if you're watching on YouTube, putting on the glasses here so I can read some stats. Man, she is aggressive. Aggressive is the perfect way to describe how she coaches basketball. Her one season at Marshall, 85.3 points per game. That was fourth in Division One. 10.6 three pointers made per game. That was third in Division One. Um, 16.4 offensive rebounds per game. That was fifth in Division One. That's really good. 
defensively or one year at Marshall. 24.2 turnovers forced per game, second in Division One. 13.2 steals per game, third in Division One. 7.94 turnover margin, for, or uh, third in Division One. That's good. It's not just offense. It's not just defense. It is aggressive all over the court. Now, how does that translate into the Southeastern Conference? We'll find out. But there's clear. It's not just a Danny White hire like I kept on saying yesterday. Sure, that's true. Up and comer. But it's also a, a certain brand that she's bringing to Knoxville, and that is aggressive on both ends of the court. Man, those girls better be in shape next year because they are going to be running. All right, so uh, Kim Caldwell has got some work to do, most notably in the transfer portal because that window closes, to my understanding, on May the 1st. I'm excited to see what she can do. Excited to see what she says in her introductory press conference that is coming up later this afternoon at about 2 o'clock. All right, when we come back, Caleb Jaro, the Daily Beacon. He's going to tell you what he thinks about the hire and about this roster that Kim Caldwell inherits. All that and more coming up next as we continue on with the Tuesday Locked on Balls. Before we get to Caleb, I want to tell you about our friends over at FanDuel. FanDuel, it is America's number one sports book. It's playoff time in the NBA, the NHL. Baseball is in full swing. And FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 bucks, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on the safe app that is secure and super easy to use. You guys know I love to get on my FanDuel Sportsbook app on the weekends, NASCAR season, so many prop bets, so many individual ways that you can win money by betting on NASCAR on the FanDuel Sportsbook app. I do it, you can do it too. But not only that, baseball, and of course, playoff time with NBA and NHL. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, it's America's number one sportsbook. Hey, Caleb, big news obviously coming in Sunday afternoon. Lady Vols hiring Kim Caldwell, Danny White making his move to replace Kelly Harper. Your initial thoughts on the move and the new hire, the new leadership for Lady Vols and Kim Caldwell. Yeah, I think we had all kind of heard that it was going to be Caldwell early or late last week, and it's kind of a surprising move. Um, you don't get a big-name coach to lead a big-name program, but when you look at Kim Caldwell's record, everywhere she's been, she's won. She started her career at Glenville State, a Division II in West Virginia. That's where she played. She led them to a conference uh, championship as a player, and then as coach, had an insane record with Glenville State, ended with the Pat Summit Award for Best Division II Coach in 2022 and earned a national championship. So she's won everywhere she went. In her one year at Marshall, she led them to the Sun Belt Championship, won the Sun Belt regular season, was Sun Belt Coach of the Year, and at, gave them an NCAA tournament berth. So the track record is there, but I know I wasn't the only one that thought it was kind of surprising that she didn't take – or that Danny White didn't hire a big-name coach that could get some, I guess, name recognition or kind of a splash hire, if you would. But I feel like Kim Caldwell fits the mold for Danny White hired, you know, young, up-and-coming coach. I feel like that kind of fits his mold. And – there's a lot riding on this hire, so I feel like she'll get all the resources and support that the athletic department can give her. Yeah, uh, you know, people in the comments yesterday were saying, well, do you like the hire or do you not like the hire? Because I was kind of dancing on both sides of the fence. But since I'm media, you know, let's hashtag dive into the negative, if you will, um, the, the downsides of this hire. You mentioned there, man, I mean, what an incredible run at Glenville State. Shout out Carson Newman, 2011, 2012, we played Glenville State. Um <laughs> And, I mean, she won a national championship. The record speaks for itself and all that. You move up. You can only do what you can where you are. You move up, and in one year, you take a program that was middle of the road, not very good in Marshall. You sweep both the Sun Belt regular season and conference championships. Go to the NCAA berth for the first time in a while. Coach of the year. Did all that type of stuff. But, again, it was one year, a Division I coaching experience. And she received the Pat Summit Award two years ago, and now she's playing in the in the building that Pat built it's got to be surreal for her, but again, the I'll get to the positives in a moment, but the 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 lack of coaching experience now at this mecca, if you will. Yeah, Tennessee Lady Vols haven't competed for a championship in years, but it's still the mecca, in my opinion. I mean, it's it's a risk by Danny White, but um, again, there's a lot a lot that you like about the hire. Yeah, it's a high there's a high ceiling. The problem is you don't know where the floor 
is yeah. at. And I feel like with former coach Kelly Harper, you knew what the floor was. You were going to make the tournament, whether it was coming in limping or coming in strong. Yeah. You're going to make the tournament and you're going to go around a 32 or sweet 16. That was your floor every season. With Kim Caldwell, I don't think you have a floor yet, but the ceiling, like you mentioned, is astronomical. She's won everywhere she's gone. There's just questions around it. Recruiting, will she be able to get some tall post players into this program that maybe Kelly Harper wasn't able to land recruiting wise? At Marshall, she had two players that were six foot tall, and that was the tallest players on the team. Wow. That's not going to play in the SEC. Will her play style, her coaching style, which I'm sure we'll talk about more later, carry over into the SEC? She wants to shoot threes and she wants to press and play defense for 94 feet and force turnovers. Not very many teams in the SEC do that. I mean, you think about South Carolina, who ran the league easily this year, led by six foot seven post player Camilla Cardosa. LSU, led by post player Angel Reese. The post is where you win and lose games oftentimes in the SEC. Can she adjust and maybe make her play style work in the SEC? Those are questions that need to be answered. I feel like we'll figure that out very quickly with her, but I'm with you. It's a high ceiling, but the floor is kind of unknown, and there's a lot of questions surrounding how she will fare in the SEC in the biggest conference. And I know somebody mentioned it in our Twitter comments, but the jump from Glenville State to Knoxville, Tennessee is a pretty big one, especially for women's basketball. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. Um uh, again, I, I feel like you kind of got into it there. Aggressive, both offensively and defensively, would be kind of the perfect word to kind of summarize the way she coaches. And I think that was appealing to Danny White. He wanted a niche. Um, he wanted a specific brand of basketball. And you kind of went into it there a little bit. Can it translate? Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see about offensive or defensively. But offensively, man, I think I wrote something down the other day that, you know, those team, her team at Marshall averaged, what, 31 three-point shot attempts? A game they were 81st in the country 33 percent from beyond the arc i mean when you shoot that volume you're gonna miss a lot as well but um i think that's exciting man just throwing it up and and, and seeing what happens but obviously you want to be good shooters but i like that brand it's very bruce pearl-esque in a number of ways not just the higher but often uh, but offensively on the court as well i think i told somebody earlier today that there, like i said there's a lot of questions surrounding kim caldwell one thing that is almost certain is that she will bring energy and life to this program. That brand of basketball is going to be fun to watch. They want to yeah. run, want to push the pace, want to shoot from beyond the arc. Like you said, near the top of Division One in her one year at Marshall in three-pointers, averaged over 90 points a game in her championship season at Glenville State. It's those types of things that kind of energize a program, make you want to play for Tennessee, make you want to run that offense. But I'm with you still. Shooting might not like what what if you have an off shooting night? Yeah. You just do you just chalk it up as a loss that night? I mean, that stuff in the SEC happens. You see it with teams all the time, specifically in women's basketball. Arkansas kind of plays that way and Missouri with the three pointers. And they're near the bottom of the league when they just want to shoot. And like Mike Neighbors in Arkansas, if the shots fall one night, they'll take that win and go home. If they don't, you just chalk it up and get back to practice the next day. You have to find consistency. I think the play style will work, but you have to find a consistent medium where, hey, if we're having an off shooting night, you have to have somebody who can get the ball in the paint and score, especially in a physical league like the SEC. I also wonder if the physicality will be an issue coming from her teams, obviously different roster, different players. But if you would have landed maybe a high name coach from a power five program, they could bring in their roster with the way the transfer portal is. How many players does she want to bring from Marshall to the SEC after one year there? There's a lot of questions with that. I'm with you though. High energy will be fun to watch. Very fast offense. It's just a matter of, can it be consistent night in and night out? And we know the expectations at Tennessee to where they're not going to – nobody here I feel will live with uh, off shooting night. We'll just chalk it up as a loss. It's going to be you win every night and you're expected to win whenever you hit the court. I mean, you, you take a step back and remove yourself from the situation and you say, okay, Tennessee just fired an alum who won three national championships, right? Yeah, and Kelly Harper. Um one of the best players ever come through here, and that's a long list of lines, of course, but she coached here two Sweet 16 appearances the last three years, 420 win-plus seasons, and and you fired her, okay? And so if you're you're in here on the, on the ground floor and you're like, yeah, it's not good enough, not good enough, but when you take a step back, it's like, man, that is something. Now, I feel like this, hadn't, this shouldn't even be a conversation, but it is because Tennessee's never gone outside of the quote-unquote family to make a hire. You had Pat Summit, Holly Warlick, former player, Kelly Harper, former player, and now you have Kim Caldwell coming in. I think this is just such a blessing for Kim Caldwell and really for the program as well. You don't have to live up to knowing there's expectations, knowing what you're stepping into. I recognize all that, but you don't have that personal weight to carry around, if you will. And I think that can do only positive things for 
Kim Caldwell, who's fresh and stepping into the situation. Yeah, I feel that way as well. I feel like breaking out of the family was needed because while Kim Caldwell's play style is very different from Holly Warwick's or Kelly Harper's, it's different from the Pat Summit tree, which I felt like was a lot more traditional and get the ball to the post. If yeah. that bucket isn't there, you pass out from there. Her play style is a lot different. I also feel like what you're kind of hitting at there, the emotional value of coming to Tennessee. I mean, there was a video of Kim Caldwell that, uh, you know, the Lady Balls posted on Twitter where she's just kind of taking everything in. Well, For somebody like her, it's like, wow, there's a lot of history here, like big expectations. For a coach like Kelly Harper, it's like, I played here, I won here. I know what it there's, takes. There's my name up there. You know, I was a part of that team, that team, you know, yeah. Yes, exactly. Like, she's coaching under her head coach's name every night. And there was a really yeah. good athletic story that was written whenever Kelly was hired about how she took over Pat Summit's program and Pat Summit wasn't there to see her do it and how that kind of weighed on her. There isn't that emotional value anymore. Yes, there's emotion. You're taking over a big name program and you want to live up to the expectations. But it's not the same as, all right, you know, Pat Summit's watching my every move. I know what she wants. I know what she wouldn't want. So I'm with you there. I feel like breaking away from the tree was needed and it was good. It's a very big break away from the tree. I mean, besides winning the Pat Summit Award, Kim Caldwell has very little ties to Tennessee. I mean, there were some coaches in the search that maybe coached against Pat Summit or overlapped with Pat Summit who had been coaching a while. But for Kim Caldwell, like I said, besides the award with Pat Summit's name on it, I don't think she has any ties to Tennessee besides obviously being knowing women's basketball. So. And again, I mean, everybody that listens to the show or if you're new to the show, you'll figure it out. I mean, I'm a big D2 guy. I mean, love love college sports. I mean, I love Division Two. That's my background. But I mean, that is a <laughs> big jump from Glenville, West Virginia to Knoxville, Tennessee. Just massive jump. So we'll see what happens. Hey, out the door, you're one of few um, that are respected daily on the beat for the Lady Vols. Okay, you know this roster arguably better than anybody, man. The, the, the Daily Beacon and what you guys do. Tell me about this roster. Obviously, I touched on in segment number one, you're losing Rakia Jackson, Tamari Key, uh, Jasmine Powell, but you bring back a number of uh, lettermen that, that fans know. Um, what are the strength weaknesses? I know it's you know a loaded question, but about 60 seconds. What are the strength weaknesses of what Caldwell has to work with right now before she starts to you know venture out into the portal and, of course, high school recruiting? Yeah, you've got Jules Spear, very good shooter from the ACC. You also have Tess Darby, who was a shooter last year for this team, but struggled. So the question is, who does she want to keep? Does she keep everybody? Do you go into the portal and get some more shooters? <coughs> Excuse me there. But the roster has pieces. We saw it with Kelly Harper. That was one of the reasons Danny White decided to go in an opposite direction. Kelly Harper had pieces to win. It wasn't a player personnel issue. The problem was the pieces didn't fit well together, and they couldn't compete in the SEC, I feel like. So what is Kim Caldwell going to do? She hasn't played in the SEC, does not know the a- SEC, doesn't know what players she needs. You bring in a good post. I think we talked about it earlier, Jillian Hollingshed. Guard skills at the forward position. She was never able to tap into her potential thus far. She has another year or two. What can she do? Caroline Striplin is undersized, but she shoots the three. That's Kim Caldwell's system. What is she going to look like? You have to get into the portal. Portal closes May 1st. That's why they wanted to hire quickly to get into the portal. And then high school recruiting. How quickly can you get a recruiting class together? So that's the 60-second rundown. I feel like there's pieces there, but the question is, what does Kim Caldwell want to do? What direction does she go? And how well can she hit the portal, and how fast can she do it? Caleb Jaro, sports editor of the Daily Beacon. Caleb, appreciate it, man. Great stuff. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. Really good stuff there from Caleb Jaro. Again, he's the sports editor of the Daily Beacon, which is the student-run newspaper at the University of Tennessee. And He's one of the few. I mean that. I mean, he's one of the few that are on the everyday beat for the Lady Vols basketball team. So I wanted to get somebody on that was much more knowledgeable about the program and kind of where it is right now. And that's what I did with Caleb. Did a great job. Go ahead and follow his work as well on the X. Okay, let's get into your mailbag questions, you everydayers. Your time to shine. That's coming up next as we continue on with the Tuesday Locked On Vols. We will start with Rob, Robo22, my guy. Big ball quester as well. Rob, we'll start with you, man. You say, hey, what do you think of all the coaches and the players and the support staff that they're going to be talking about after spring practice is over? In other words, what will the buzz be about this team? Um, It's a good question. I think Nico is going to get a whole lot of it. I mean, there's not been a whole lot of talk about Nico in spring practice, to be honest, because, I mean, he's been solid, and, and there's other pressing things to be looking at for this team. I think the buzz is going to be talking about the running back position. 
Um, once we at least get to see eyes on these guys and scrimmage a little bit on that on that Saturday, how does Deshaun Bishop, Bishop look? How does Khalifa Keith look? The offensive line, who even plays in the orange and white game? Which I don't, you know, we know Javante Spragans won't play. I, I'd be shocked if Cooper Mays plays. If he does play, he'll play a series. And I got news for you guys. Sorry to um, disappoint you, but Nico's going to go in there. He's going to play a series or two. He's going to throw five passes. He's going to grab a clipboard, and that's going to be the day for him, as it should be. No sense in injuring anybody in a spring game, especially someone that holds so much weight for your football team like Nico or Cooper Mays. So I think the talk will be about the defense, the defensive line, because they just dominated so far in spring practice. Um, we know how good that unit is. And I think a lot of the talk is going to be about the secondary. I would expect some of those guys in the secondary to make some plays in the orange and white game that we get to see with our eyes and say, well, man, I hadn't seen a whole lot of that. Or, ooh, that'd be great to see against Florida this fall. Um, kind of kind of what a lot of the buzz is right now. Um Secondary, athletic, quick, wide receiver, the competition there, running back, you know, what's going to happen, and of course, uh, Nico. So that's kind of what I think, and um, obviously we'll see exactly what happens after the orange and white game. Um, Aaron says, hey, Eric, based on what we know so far, which is not much, who do you predict to be our leading wide receiver in 2024? Um, That's easy for me right now because I will remain, my answer to this will always be who the slot receiver is. I recognize Cedric Tillman played on the outside, and he had a great year in 2021. But boy, did, did Valus Jones have a breakout year as well in the slot that year. We know about Jalen Hyde in 2022, and even in a down year for Tennessee football offensively in 2023, Squirrel White had more than double the amount of catches than Romel Keaton had at the end of the regular season, and Keaton finished in second. Keaton led the team with six receiving touchdowns, but Squirrel White had the best year of any wide receiver. So my answer right now will still be Squirrel White, in the slot, but man, I can't wait to watch Brazo. Can't wait to watch Thornton. Can't wait to watch Brew get back as well. Let's go to Jared. Jared says, "Do you think this team, talking about the baseball team, sets the program record for home runs in a season? Looking pretty dang good right now. 2022 team had 156, and our pace right now will put us just short of that, excluding the playoffs." Um, I don't know if I said this on yesterday's show. I know I wrote it in the three two one over at VolQuest.com yesterday. Tennessee entered the weekend trailing number two in the nation in home runs, trailing Georgia, whatever the number was, it was like by 11. Okay. Um, like 70, it was 84 to 73. And yeah, that's it. Tennessee hit 14 home runs on the planes at Auburn 14. So now they stand at 87. Georgia hit three home runs in their weekend series. I think they played Alabama. I can't remember. Mississippi state. I can't remember. Yeah. Mississippi state. And now they sit at 87. So Tennessee, away from the Mickey Mouse ballpark that is Lindsey Nelson Stadium, right? Because that's what the national people and fans of other uh, teams around the SEC will tell you. Tennessee only hits home runs because they play in a small ballpark, but away from the Mickey Mouse Stadium that is Lindsey Nelson Stadium, Tennessee smashed 14 home runs. Sure, it's a short wall on left at, all, at Plainsman Park, but they had a green monster. I can't tell you how many home runs went over that green monster this weekend. Uh, Tennessee and Georgia now tied for most home runs in the country after this weekend. So at 87, uh, so to answer your question, um, they have a couple more weekends like they just had. Yeah. This team could smash. They're fun to watch. Um, and, and, and it's balanced, man. I mean, Simo, Dryling, Burke, tears, Amick when he's in there, Dean Curley's had a lot of home runs. This team's been fun to watch. So, you know, let's say yes. Let's say yes. Let's, let's have something to look forward to. Um, another question has Bargo earned at least the DH role, when Billy comes back? That's a really great question, and I wrote about this as well. I love baseball because in a three-game series, you can have three different lineups depending on matchups, righties, left, people, tune options, splits, all that and more. Big baseball nerd, okay? Love baseball. Love football. Um, Dalton Bargo's earned it, man, in my opinion. They're siding with offense. Not like he's playing bad third base in place of Billy Amick. In fact, he's playing really, really well. But you're not seeing much of Ariel Antigua, who's the best defensive glove on the team, because he only has eight at-bats on the year because he missed so much time. Dean Curley's playing fine defensively at short, and of course we know what he can do with the bat. My point is, Tennessee is having to side with offense because they're having to outscore opponents more this year, whereas they had pitching they could depend on in years past. In saying that, Bargo being the DH would make a whole lot of sense. But that doesn't mean that I think Bargo will be the DH for every game. I still think Robin will get a, a start every now and again. I still think that you will see Reese Chapman as well 
continue to work in that role as well. So um, Bargo, I don't think is going to be missing from the lineup at weekends at a time. He's earned the opportunity to play, in my opinion. But uh, again, I don't get paid $1.5 million or whatever it is to make those calls. Um, let's go to Adam. Adam says, how do you think the interior defensive line rotation works out? Vols seem to be loaded there. Yeah, they are. Um, you know, we'll see. It's all about snap counts. Rodney Garner always says, once that tank goes empty, you can't go put more gas in it for a defensive lineman in a football game. Once it goes empty, you're pretty much done. So they go into it with a set number of snap counts they try to get for those guys. And some will have more than others, obviously. James Pierce will play more than anybody out there. Um, and, of course, when they're in pass rushing situations, Pierce and Josephs and Caleb Herring will be on the field at the same time. I mean, as far as, like, these four get this series, these four get this, I, I don't know. It's more down in distance and more situational, in my opinion. But, again, 12 to 13, gosh, man, maybe 14 guys are going to play this year on the defensive line. Strength in numbers. And James Pierce is going to lead the way because he is an absolute stud. We'll continue on. Um, let's go to Jacob. Jacob says, this question is for tomorrow's Lockdown Ball Show. All this weekend, these people have talked about the late game offensive foul called against UConn during their game against Iowa. A lot of people say you can't call that there, but I have the opinion that players shouldn't have fouled there, especially with such an obvious foul. I would be interested to know your opinion on the refs and swallowing the whistle late in game situations in general. Should they or should they have not called the foul? And uh, let me know what you say. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. You know what's tough? Have I sat here and said, you can't call that in that situation? Plenty of times. Plenty of times. I guess the simplest answer I can give you, Jacob, because I'm not an official and I know it's hard. It's tough work. The simplest answer I can give you is I want consistency. Talk about a strike zone all the time. Now, midweek games when Tennessee's blowing out its opponent by 15 runs is a different story. Let's get the hell out of here, right? Sorry for the cussing. Um, but all, I want a consistent strike zone. If you call that a strike or a ball in the in the first inning and Trackman says that it's that it's wrong, but but you're consistent with it, these players know, these batters know, hey, he's not giving the outside corner. You got to swing at that. He's not giving it. So that they know not to keep the bat on their shoulder in the fifth inning and then in the ninth inning. If it's consistent, you know. So if officials in a basketball game and a football game, umpires in a baseball game are at least consistent in how they're calling a game, that's all I can ask for. Maybe it should be a foul, but if you're not calling that specific play every single time in the ball game, at least you know. So should should officials swallow their whistles in the last couple of seconds? No, but they shouldn't go out of their way to call a foul in that situation that wasn't a foul in the first half or vice versa, if that makes sense. I uh, hope I answered your question. Brayden always has some good thinkers, man. Here's another one. What is the best a Tennessee position group has ever been throughout the history in one singular year? This could branch off into a separate show, but immediately I thought of the defensive line. 20, 2001, Albert Hainsworth, John Henderson, both were first-round draft picks. Okay, Tennessee's defensive line is deeper now. But in terms of top-end talent, was never better than John Henderson and Albert Hainsworth in 2001, <clears throat> both being first-round draft picks. Um, and I think Henderson won the Outland Trophy as well. Secondly, I thought of the running back room. In 1999, Tennessee had Jamal Lewis, Travis Henry, Travis Stevens, and Ontario Smith. Not bad. Back in 93, Tennessee's running backs were James Stewart, Aaron Hayden, Charlie Garner, Jay Graham. Not bad, right? Um, so I think I would start with the defensive line with Hainsworth and, and um, with Hainsworth and Henderson. But if I had to give a second answer, it would probably be that 1999 running back room of Jamal Lewis, Travis Stevens, and Smith. Uh, great question. Here's another one. This is for fun. These duos are paired up and going against each other. One of them has to win to save your life. Who do you pick to win? Derek Dooley with JG or Butch Jones with Nathan Peterman. Uh, this is really fun. If JG is young and healthy, I don't care if he's playing for Butch or for Dooley. I'm taking JG. JG has more top-end talent 
than a lot of quarterbacks that have been here in the last 15 years. He was just broken, and he was just run down, and he was scared, and he was inconsistent. If you give me a healthy JG early in his career, I'll take him over anything. So JG and Dooley would be my pick because, of course, we saw what happened with Butch Jones and Nathan Peterman, albeit he had a broken hand uh, down in the swamp, which I think was a little bit ridiculous for his first start. Let's go to Tyler. Um, Has there been a DB to play a significant role for the staff that they have recruited from high school? If Gibson don't start, how concerning is that? Is it as big of a deal as O-line? Good question. I'm trying to think right now. In the last three years, no. Nobody that this staff recruited in the secondary has played a significant role. Okay? Significant role. Jordan Thomas has played but I wouldn't say significant as, uh, as of yet. Um, Ricky Gibson is, you know, barring injury, he's going to start. But still, rotation-wise in the secondary, he's going to be part of it anyway. But he should start. Um, is it as big of a deal as an offensive as the offensive line conundrum? In my opinion, no, it's not. I mean, guys, unless Sham starts, you're looking at the fourth straight year that this staff has started an offensive line, and not one of them has been a high school recruit that they brought up. From, from from the prep ranks. That's wild. That is really, really wild. Um, got a couple more here. Actually, got two more here, and this is from Garrett via the text line. Um, are you worried about AJ Causey and his last two outings? Are teams starting to figure out his timing and arm angles? Yeah, I'm worried, man, because he was so good. And then I had it in my three, two, one. He's given up like <laughs> 15 runs, 14 earned in his last two starts. It's incredible, man. Not in a good way. Um, a lot of time he's just not locating, but it's why it's a different angle and why I love him from the bullpen, and I kept on saying that to begin the season because it's just a different look. Now, he was pitching so well, there was no reason to move him out of the starting rotation, and I think he'll still go there this this weekend, but, man, one more outing like that, and he's getting replaced, and they got to figure some things out. So to answer your question, I still think there's a lot of potential, and I still think that he's going to play a big role regardless if it's out of the bullpen or starting games because he's going to pitch for Tennessee this year. But am I worried about it right now? Absolutely, for sure. And then last question from Garrett. Dallin Hayden enter the portal. When we might need a running back depth seems too good to be true. Do you think we go after him? Um, People that cover recruiting, people around the, um, you know, the team that are closer to the situation than I am at this time, I would say probably not at this time. That can always change. But it does seem too good to be true, right? Legacy player from the state of Tennessee. We know his dad's Aaron Hayden. Mentioned him early on the podcast. Good player. Had a couple really good games back in 2022. It's been an afterthought at Ohio State. Tennessee's looking for a running back potentially. Have they seen enough from Deshaun Bishop? We'll find out. But at this time, I'll say no. But, man, I would like to be wrong about that. I'd like to see Dallin Hayden here on campus. Uh, We'll see exactly how that transpires. Hey, appreciate you guys as always. Good show today. Appreciate Caleb for stopping by. Thank you guys for sending in your mailbag questions. Um, We'll talk to Josh Ward for a little Ward Wednesday. We'll get everything else you guys need for the rest of the week regarding Tennessee football, recruiting, all that and more. You can find it right here on your daily podcast for the Tennessee Volunteers. It is Locked On Balls. Follow, listen, subscribe, download all that for free on the Locked On Balls YouTube channel and wherever you get your podcast. Appreciate you guys. Shout out every day, and we'll talk again tomorrow. This is Locked On Balls.